Earlier, you talked about Sung San Sanim reaching enlightenment, um, chanting the Dharani uh, 20 hours a day and eating the pine needles. And I was thinking about um, the, the whole purpose of our meditation. Is it for us to reach enlightenment? Like, is it possible to reach enlightenment? Absolutely. It is possible. But uh, anytime some student of Sung San Sunim's wanted to try similar 100-day retreats, Kun Sunim said no. And they asked him, why, sir, if you could do this, why couldn't we? He said, it's not necessary. And he also said, if I had met my teacher earlier, maybe I should not have done this 100-day retreat in the way I had done. So what you should know about this technique, eating crushed pine needle, is that it is really an old Taoist technique to desiccate and dehydrate the body. And it's very dangerous. So when we mean awakening, we do not mean just physical asceticism. We have physical discipline because it is necessary to control the body. If you don't control the body, you cannot control the mind either. So yeah, the ultimate task is awakening. But we have a lot of problems that we have to solve in between. And those solutions are very, very precious. So in that sense, the relative practice and the absolute practice are not different. So don't check your mind. Don't check your level of enlightenment. Don't check your level of ignorance either. Moment to moment, keep clear. Moment to moment, just do it. Then everything becomes simple, manageable, selfless, and for all beings. Um, I have a few questions about the mantras that we're doing, um, and the um, the uh, the ones that you suggested for me to do initially. I feel like I've you know memorized it sufficiently. But um, first question is uh, the uh, the effectiveness of the mantras. Uh, is it more when you're actually completely memorized all the mantras and it's, it's more effective or does it not matter that we're, you know, reading, you know, and is that in, in reading it and trying to learn it and fumbling over it, it still has the same efficacy or what? Don't check that poor mantra. Use the mantra. So those short mantras that I suggested, you're so smart, I think you knew them 15 seconds later. Mm -hmm. So use them in your meditation time, okay? And the rest, whether you use the chanting book or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you do not have any thinking while you are doing your mantra. Mm -hmm. Don't think about the mantra, just recite it. Inside, outside, loud, soft, doesn't matter. Okay. Because when you think about it, you open another new layer in the mind, and that, <coughs> and that reduces the efficiency. That's the only problem. So don't think about the mantra. Don't check your mantra. Use the mantra. One mind. You become the mantra 100%. Then it doesn't matter whether you use the chanting book or not. Um, there's, the, there's one Mike, one. Mike, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, yeah. One of the... One of the ones, um, I think it's the sh Shurangata. Shurangama, yeah. Th yeah, that one. Um, and uh, I read the translation, and it you know, talks a lot about uh, basically protecting, protecting us from all these different uh, problems. Um, it, I'm just curious, can you explain a little bit about that, that mantra and why it's important? Yeah. Um, the Shurangama or the Pratyangiram Dharani, is one of the dharanis that the Korean tradition uses. And if you want to read it, it's right on the wall. This is that yellow scroll. It has the Siddham Sanskrit and the Korean Hangul, one next to the other. And uh, legend has it that from the crown chakra of the Buddha, an entire pavilion of light appeared. And from the Buddha's teaching, all these qualities and all these protectors emanated. So that's just a fairy tale to give you an idea what it means. But if you look at these qualities in the mantra itself, 
you can see that we are actually protecting ourselves from ourselves. So that all our bad karma would go away in the form of these entities and then we are simple and clear true human beings. That's all it takes. But for that we have to make effort. So the emanation of the Buddha's teaching in the form of this light, in the form of this pavilion, all the dwellers in this pavilion, that's the Pratyangiram Dharani. That's the yang part, the emanation part. The yin is the Nilakanta Dharani, or the Great Compassion Dharani, which we are also doing every single day. That's really important. So that no matter what happens, you respond with compassion. No matter how the world treats you, it doesn't change you into someone you shouldn't be because you do not want to be. So these two dharanis form one unit, one fantastic union of yin and yang, emanation and reception. And the third very important part, which we recited so many times that it doesn't even stand out, is the Heart Sutra. That's the one which clears us from any delusions any notion of self, any dualities as absolute. That's the great cleaner. So when that happens and you are free from any false sense of identity, then both dharanis can function very well. Okay? So these three are the care package of any Mahayana Buddhist. And that's why I feel specifically lucky that I'm part of the kind of tradition that has all the three of them combined. And this is wonderful. How long would it take for most people to memorize that, that, that long one? How would I know? <laughs> How long did it take you? I, you see, the whole sheet is in front of me. So sometimes I know it, sometimes I don't know it. When my mind is busy, it forgets some of the catalogs. Then I look, oops, then I, I should do this. When my mind is you know, less busy, then I remember the catalogs. And sometimes it's interesting that, you know, some thought, some immediate duty is knocking at the door. And at some point in the mantra, while you recite it, it kicks off one of the lines. And you lose track. And you've done this a thousand times. And where did that go? So that's a good experience. Okay? To be clear and to be present and to do this. So, yeah, we try to memorize it. But I'm a lazy monk. I do not use any chanting books outside of the Dharma room. So only while I'm here, I do this, and as long as it takes, it's fine. How can you do this really well? One way, just like the first question, you don't think while you are doing the mantras. Then it rubs in layer by layer, occasion after occasion, day by day. The mantra rubs in and forms this solid memory. And the solid memory is important. I want these mantras to be with me when I die. I want these mantras to be with me when I'm reborn. I want these mantras to be with me when I choose my next tradition. Lifetime after lifetime. It makes sense. It's not just the great bodhisattva vows. It's not just the ten great vows. Once you realize what this practice is about, it makes perfect sense that you choose your path. And this path is nothing less than awakening and helping all beings from suffering. Now, that has a toolkit. And that toolkit is this mantra, all the mantras, sitting techniques, meeting the teacher, meeting the teaching, meeting the sangha. It's all there. So if you put that into the mind, central place, number one important, focus, then that will guide you, whether you have a body or not, whether a human being or not, whether in this world or not, doesn't matter straight only going straight okay uh, i'm sure like everyone um to make the decision to come here to do uh however long or short of a retreat is uh is a uh um is in some ways a sacrifice but in some ways a, a real blessing i consider it being a real blessing to be here for four weeks um and uh it's strange because normally um, talking to people and getting to know the people, but I don't, you know, I maybe know some people's names, but I know no one's background, no one's 
Lucky this you. History. Imagine you did. <laughs> wow. So it's it's a in in not only is it a personal retreat, but it's a very different type of interaction with people because it's it has nothing to do with anyone else, but we're still in the same space. You yeah. know? Um, uh, and I feel a great amount of compassion for the people around me too. Like I, I hope that they're getting what they mm -hmm. need. Um, but uh, um, as, as we are meditating together, but we're doing our own thing, um, I'm sure that there's a great power uh, with everyone doing this together. Like, what's actually happening? Like, in a, in this type of space, like, are we sh are we picking up on each other's vibes from time to time when we're when we're meditating? Uh, so, I don't know. How, how would that. I know? <laughs> I'm just looking at the floor right in front of myself, <laughs> and sometimes ring the bell and chant some mantras. That's all I do. You're too smart. You want to know everything. I let you experience this in your own way. Sit. And don't stop at your own personal boundary in terms of spatial perception. Extend your spatial perception to the whole room. And then whatever you perceive, you perceive. But don't check other people's minds. Don't check what's going on in space. Don't check what's going on inside from an external or projected point of view. That's not necessary. Just keep clear, keep it even, like space, like a mirror. That's all. But practicing together, following the same schedule, eating the same food, sleeping virtually under the same roof has great power. Because it's like we have this common karma called human being. We are all human beings. And this is like a cart, many times stuck in the mud. So when we do this meticulous and clear practice together, it's like having this rhythmic, concerted effort to push this cart out of the mud. In Hungarian, horuk, horuk, one, two, one, two. So when we sit together, eat together, work together, interviews, dharma talks, everything, that's like harmonizing everybody's consciousness. No matter how small your karma is, when you're alone, it can become very big. Now, you're in this room. No matter how big your personal karma is, it becomes very, very small. Much smaller than in a you know, solo retreat or in a, an apartment where you just live alone. And that's the power that we have, that together, we synchronize and then we make this rhythmic concerted effort to clean ourselves and indirectly each other from our own hindrances, difficulties, etc. Now that's very observable. It's very palpable. You can feel this very well during meditation. And that's also part of the beauty of together action. Three years ago I was in the same situation as you are now. I was in a Korean Zen room being the only foreigner, but I understood Korean well enough to know what they are talking about, so if I wanted to be part of it, I could. And of course, most of those things that they were talking about were not concerning me. I didn't know most of those temples, most of those monks, I was not part of those issues. So I realized, since that was not a silent retreat, that I have to talk to them because it's a matter of interaction and being part of that community. Being the only white face in the group, I couldn't afford just to go as silent as I wanted to be. So casually and lightly, I was part of these conversations in between of getting too much involved, I didn't want that, and being too much like an outsider. Both have their bad consequences. So I stayed in the middle way of being naturally and generally accepted, but not too much involved in the affairs that they mentioned. It paid off very well. And they say goodbye, and you see the recognition and this, this kind of respect in their eyes, then you know you have done a good job. And those people who did not you know, then I made the mistake. Either I overdone 
the communication or I underdone the communication. And I've done that, then I, I, I could see where I went wrong. One more move, one more word, one less word, one less gesture, then you, then you pay the price. But your situation in this community, in this Sangha, is very different. So you don't have to feel that you have to make an effort to be part of this, because you already are. That's part of the history in Korea, that you got immersed in Buddhism uh, in Korea, and you got some teaching way before you came, so you could prepare. And most people you need to interact with speak English, luckily. Okay? So that's, that's way to go.